Let the Bible Speak with your speaker, Brett Hickey. Early on in John's Gospel, we're presented with Peter's introduction to Jesus. The Lord obviously had special plans for him from the very beginning. We read in John 1, verse 40 through 42, One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Now when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. With the exception of the Apostle John, no man on earth experienced a greater closeness and camaraderie with the Son of God than this Galilean fisherman. Although the Apostle Peter played a pivotal role in Jesus' ministry and proved to be a tremendous asset for the Lord in the beginning and early development of the church and the initial spreading of the gospel, this New Testament hero was not without his faults and shortcomings. The adversary, the devil, was equally intent on using Peter for his own purposes. Shortly after predicting his betrayal to the twelve, Jesus told Peter in Luke 22, verse 31 through 34, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail, and when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. But he said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Then Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny me three times, deny three times that you know me. Peter's protests notwithstanding, Jesus' prediction came true not much later. First, though, Peter, along with the other members of the inner circle of disciples, James and John, let him down by falling asleep during Jesus' hour of great agony in the garden. When he pleaded with them repeatedly to watch and pray, Luke 22, verse 39 through 46. Peter did have a moment of bravado when the authorities came to arrest Jesus. After Judas' kiss of betrayal, Peter cut the ear off of the servant of the high priest with his sword. Instead of commending Peter, though, Jesus admonished him in Matthew 26, 52, Put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Unfortunately, the courage Peter had mustered in defending his Lord disappeared. We read next in Matthew 26, 56, Then all the disciples, including Peter, forsook him and fled. Next, we read in Matthew 26, 57 and 58, And those who had laid hold of Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance to the high priest's courtyard. And he went in and sat with the servants to see the end. Peter cowered with the crowd while Jesus endured the lies of false witnesses and the abuse of the high priest and his allies. Then in Matthew chapter 26, verse 69 through 75, when Peter was confronted by a young lady who said she recognized him as a companion of Jesus, Peter initiated a string of denials. Finally, according to Matthew 26, verses 74 and 75, then he began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. Immediately, a ro rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus, who had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So he went out and wept bitterly. One of the demonstrations that the Bible is true and not fiction is its transparency in covering the lives of men and women of faith. Their ugly side is not hidden. The story of Simon Peter is one of human weakness and immaturity, but also one of remarkable potential and eventually great spiritual progress. We can learn a lot about Peter and from Peter, uh, as well as from Peter. But first, enjoy our song. I Bye. 
After the lovely name of Jesus, no other name occurs as frequently in the Gospels as does Peter's name. For better or for worse, no disciple speaks as much or as often. Peter is the man Jesus most praised among the twelve, but he is also the one most often rebuked. Peter was first to confess Christ and to voice his support for Jesus, but Peter was also the first to contradict Christ and the first to run interference. Consider this series of statements made by Peter preserved for us by the Holy Spirit. We have toiled all night and caught nothing. Depart from me, O Lord, for I am a sinful man. Lo, we have left all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? Be it far from thee, Lord. This shall never be to thee. Though all men deny thee, I, I will not. Lord, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elijah. How oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Thou shalt never wash my feet, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. I know not the man. Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. Lord, save me. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. To whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us, what was I that I could withstand God? This collection of Peter's sayings and the stories surrounding them give us a good idea of what kind of man Peter was. One sign of the Bible's inspiration is how honest it is in presenting its heroes. We see the good and the bad of the greatest men and women. We see Abraham's cowardice, Moses' violence, David's adultery, and Peter's rashness. Early on, Peter was fearful, flaky, and boastful. But for all his faults, Peter was a man of great warmth, passion, and energy, and Jesus loved him for it. Jesus used these qualities to mold and to make Peter into a great apostle, even a leader among the apostles. The idea, however, that Peter was the first pope is unsustainable by Scripture, totally devoid of biblical support. Instead, Jesus says in Matthew 28, verse 18, all power in heaven and in earth is given unto me. Peter himself addresses other elders in 1 Peter 5, verse 1, as fellow elders, and Jesus, not himself, as the only chief shepherd. In Romans 16, Paul sends greetings to numerous brothers and sisters at the church in Rome, but fails to send greetings to Simon Peter, the man who was supposed to be the pope at Rome. Why? Because Peter wasn't at Rome, and there was no pope. Think about it. If Peter were a pope in Rome, why would the church at Rome need the apostle Paul to write the Roman Christians an epistle to help settle their difficulties? Jesus plainly warned, call no man father, meaning, of course, in a universal spiritual sense. Only God fits that description. The pope, meanwhile, claims to be universal bishop head of the church. There is, in fact, a statue supposedly of St. Peter in Rome. The foot of this bronze statue has been kissed so many times that only a nub remains of a bronze statue. Yet, in Acts 10, when Cornelius fell down and worshiped Peter in elated appreciation for bringing the gospel to him, Peter corrected him, stand up, I myself I'm also a man. It was our beloved brother Peter who boldly proclaimed Jesus' true identity in Matthew 16. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. This declaration, this confession, Jesus called the rock, the great foundation on which he would build his church. Yes, 
Jesus singled Peter out when he said in Matthew 16, 19, I will give you the keys to the kingdom, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. But in Matthew 18, 18, Jesus conferred the same blessing, the same authority on all of the apostles. Peter was a leader among the apostles, but no man was given universal headship or universal authority in the church. Meanwhile, it was Paul who was declared by Scripture to be the apostle to the Gentiles in Romans 11:13. Though the apostle Paul falls for, far short of being universal bishop, he comes much closer to this place than does Peter. Peter writes, but two books of the New Testament, while Paul writes 13 or possibly 14. In 2 Corinthians 11, verse 5, Paul declares, I am not at all inferior to the most eminent apostles. As a matter of fact, the apostle Paul rebukes the apostle Peter in Galatians chapter 2 for a serious error that Peter made. At the same time, Peter played a special role in the first century scheme of things. Handpicked by Jesus as one of the twelve, Jesus gave him a unique opportunity to know him and his teachings. More than that, Peter, along with James and John, was privy to events even the other apostles were not. The transfiguration, the healing of Peter's mother-in-law, proving incidentally that Peter was married, and the prelude to the agony in the garden. Peter's place among the four lists of the apostles is impressive. In each list are three groupings of four apostles. Each grouping has the same four apostles. The order of the middle names is varied, but the first and last apostles in, in the list always remain the same. Peter is always first, Judas Iscariot last. This is no coincidence. Peter is always first because of his prominent role on Pentecost and beyond. We read in Acts chapter 2, verse 14, Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said unto them, and then Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Then in Acts 3, verse 12, So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people. Acts 4, verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Acts 4, 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, Acts 4, 19, Peter and John said unto them, and we could go on. We speak of this book of early church history as Acts of the Apostles, but it is largely the Acts of Peter and Paul. Bartholomew and Andrew, for example, were apostles. But what do you remember of them in this book? Peter had no more authority than the other apostles, but he was gifted for a special work. Let's notice how little separated the first and the last in this list of apostles. The name Judas, which means praise God, was very common in Jesus' day. Seven different men with this name are mentioned in the New Testament, including one of Jesus' ancestors, Luke 3.30, one of Jesus', uh, Jesus brothers, Matthew 13.55, and the brother of James, a faithful apostle. And yet, Judas' name lives in infamy. We wouldn't even name our dog Judas, even though another apostle brought honor and dignity to the same name. Judas Iscariot betrayed his friend, his mentor, his creator with a casual kiss. Judas Iscariot allied himself with the enemy for 30 pieces of silver. As esteemed as Peter is, how much separates Peter and Judas? Look at Matthew 26, verse 31 through 35, where Peter declares his superior allegiance, even to the point of death. But Peter also walked in darkness, a guilty distance from the Lord. Shortly after his blessed confession of Jesus' deity, Peter's contrary words so disturbed Jesus that Jesus responded, Get thee behind me, Satan. Before his conversion, Peter could be a man of extremes, from 
violently defending Jesus to shamelessly abandoning and denying his Lord. We marvel at how disappointing Peter could be, but are we any better under much less pressure when presented with an opportunity to stand up for our Savior? How do we fare? When you see you are living in sin or practicing religious error, are you willing to abandon it on Jesus' account? How often have our actions shouted, I don't really know Jesus, or at least not well enough to speak his name, unless, of course, I'm sure my audience has the same love for Jesus and the same convictions about his word. Is that any better than Peter's cowardly inaction? These are tough questions, but they beg to be answered. We need that cold, hard look in the mirror that Peter took after hearing the cock crow. Often, we're confronted with our error in time to make corrections. Will we make the correction that Judas failed to make? Let me say it another way. What are you doing with Jesus today? How loyal have you been lately? How loyally are you living to the dictates of his word? How often do you think of him, of his love, of his sacrifice, of his pleading for your soul's salvation? How often do you assemble with his saints? How often do you read and meditate on his words? How often do you talk of him to others? Have you been born of the water and of the Spirit, John 3, 5? Is your relationship with Jesus Christ thriving and growing or shrinking and stagnating? Do you long to talk to the Father frequently in Jesus' name? Or is prayer a chore, a bore, or an outlet reserved only for emergencies? Perhaps the greatest lesson we can glean from the impact of the Lord on the life of Peter is the potential Jesus saw in him. The name Peter or Cephas, which means rock or stone, was not given to Simon by his parents, but by Jesus. When Jesus gave Simon the name Peter, it wasn't because of his present strength or stability, but rather because Jesus could see what kind of man Simon, the son of Jonas, could someday become. And you know what? Jesus sees that kind of man or woman that you can become starting today. He sees your potential for good. Jesus knows how much influence you can have for right. He recognizes your potential strengths that maybe you can't even see in yourself. He has a special place for you in his kingdom. But Jesus won't force you. He stands and knocks at the door of your heart, but you must let him in. It's your call. What will you do with Jesus? Judas, though, he was too wicked. Thought, he thought he was irredeemable, although Saul of Tarsus was in the same boat. Judas turned his back on the forgiveness that flooded Jesus' preaching. But Peter and Paul reached out for pardon and never looked back. In John chapter 21, after the resurrection, Peter and six of the 12 spent all night unsuccessfully fishing in the Sea of Tiberias. But their fishing trip was not a total wash. In the morning, they saw Jesus on the shore. When they responded to his call to cast the net on the right side of the boat, their net was so filled with fish they could not bring it into the boat. They knew instantly that it was their risen Lord. Peter plunged into the water and swam towards shore while the others dragged the fish to shore in the boat. After eating breakfast in John 21, verse 15 through 17, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. 
Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Jesus challenges Peter's devotion. And this was agonizing. But in the process, Peter was reclaimed as an ambassador, apostle, and shepherd for the people of God. Peter proved to be worthy of Christ's renewed confidence. Not long after, it was the apostle Peter who preached the first gospel sermon and proclaimed the entrance into the kingdom of God in Acts chapter 2. Peter convicted the assembled multitude of killing the promised Messiah. Peter proved from the prophetic words of David that Jesus was the risen Lord, and their hands were stained with his blood. Many were cut to the heart, and with the same longing Peter had to be restored to the grace of God, they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? In response to their plea, Peter declared in Acts 2, verse 38 and 39, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission, the forgiveness of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. We learn two verses later, Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day 3,000 souls were added unto them. And Paul played such a pivotal role. This morning, that promise is to you as well. Jesus' blood can wash away your blackest sins. There is power in the blood. God is the God of second chances. If you would like a copy of this message, stay with us, and we'll tell you how you can get one right after our song. Thank you for watching Let the Bible Speak. We pray that you have heard God speak to you through His Word. There's someone here today who's listening who realizes that their, their relationship with God is not what it should be. We hope that you will contact us and someone can help you make sure that you can restore that relationship with God. Or perhaps you've never become a Christian. We'll share with you how you can obey the gospel and know tonight that if the Lord were to come back, you'd be ready to meet Him. Well, we always welcome any of your comments and questions. If you'd like to get a copy of this sermon, Peter, number 851, please call or write us. We also offer a free Bible study course that you can complete at home. Visit LetTheBibleSpeak.com where you can watch videos of the program at your convenience. We echo the sentiments of the Apostle Paul when he wrote in Romans chapter 16, 16, the churches of Christ salute you. Until next week, goodbye and God bless.